everybody. Uh, next speaker up is Mike Godfrey. Uh, he's going to talk about how we cost our client 1.2 million pounds with four lines of code and less than two hours. So give a round of applause for Mike. Go ahead, Mike. Hello. Well, thanks a lot for coming. Well, um, we've got a lot to get through in a short amount of time, so we'll get straight into it. But um, as you heard, I'm Mike. I'm at Mike G Hacks. Um, I'm the founder of Insinia. I'm a qualified pen tester. I'm a qualified CCNA, CEH. I spent 10 years in priority, about 23 years in breaking it. Um, I specialise in hardware and physical, and I'm a qualified commercial and industrial electrician and gas engineer. So she started out in ICS as a commercial gas engineer. Um, to tell you a quick few bits about this talk, we carry out impact-based pen testing. So you're not going to see Nessus scans, you're not going to see that sort of output. We take on about 10 clients a year, so people that, that come to us really want to know the true impact of, um, of what's going to happen in their systems. I usually give this talk to my colleague Paul Hunter, he couldn't be here, but um, my colleague Simon is. So ask me anything, Simon's also outside of a PLC, and we're going to talk about how to lose £1.2 million in two hours, about $2 million. So to tell you a bit about us, we're probably the UK leaders in ICS security training. We've got a 16,500 square foot lab that's got loads of legacy technology. It's got all the main manufacturers, Siemens, Omron, Allen Bradley, etc. Um, we're the only gas safe cyber security company in the UK. We'll talk about why that's relevant in a minute. We've got 10 years experience in attacking ICS and we're sitting in Gilles Free Training Centre. But this is a couple of pictures of our lab. So this is one area, it's a bottle implant and a, and a gas rig. It's one of our robotic arms, it's an ABB. And this is one of our gamification rigs. <coughs> but here we've got a short video that shows you a bit about what we do. So, I said we're gas safe registered, what does that actually mean? Well, gas appliances in the UK, this is a typical domestic appliance. These are from like 24 to 40 kilowatt. But when we're talking about gas systems, what we're actually talking about is things like this. So things that are up to 70,000 kilowatt, 70 megawatt. So when we talk about gas throughout this talk, this is really what we're talking about. Now to talk about a few things on SCADA, Firstly, SCADA is probably not what you think, nor is an industrial control system. So a better description would really be control system. The Blasio fountains are on the control system, similar sorts of things. But these cover everything from industrial process, military equipment, um, transportation. In fact, this is what people, most people um, accept as SCADA. But it's prevalent in transportation, in electric, in healthcare, in water, in building management systems, in natural gas, in oil, in chemical, manufacturing. So what's the problem with securing all these things? Now, this is an image from Joe Weiss, and basically it outlines the, the problem perfectly. Now, the issue is that you've got ICS engineers who haven't really integrated properly with IT, and you've got IT security specialists who don't really understand the engineering side of it. On that basis, it's very, very difficult to work out what is a cyber attack and what is a cyber failure, because there's a massive skills gap. Um, when these failures happen, they almost cause wars. We'll talk about that in a minute. And the RF in the UK is still installing their 7300s. It's a really old technology. If we have a look at the problem with that technology, it's old technology, it's insecure by design, it's cross-protocol, you've got to secure level one to level three devices, so you've got insufficient backups, which is a big problem, because if you drop the power to an old PLC, then it deletes the program, drops the program. So without proper backups, it's a big issue. But because these are such good pieces of kit and they're so reliable, they don't really warrant a full-time on-site technical facility. So there really isn't ICS engineers on every single location, and there's a lack of ICS security experts. 
Uh, to fly through these, as so I said, we're, we're quite um, short on time. These are really easy to access. That's why they're not great for, for hackers. They've got little or no security. They've got default hard-coded credentials quite often. Um, and it should really say there's no protection from physical attacks, because there really isn't. Um, there's almost no traceability or forensic evidence when these are attacked. They're very easy to attack remotely, and there's a range of attack vectors at all levels. Now, when we have a look at the types of attack that we see on these, ransomware and DDoS aren't as prevalent, but they do still exist. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, sensor spoofing is a really big thing, and disrupting and stopping the process is obviously the aim of what we want to do when we run a pen test. Um, tampering with SCADA and HMIs, and the list goes on. But really, the problem is that these things aren't always baking cakes. They can create harsh chemical reactions, reach super high temperatures, get to immensely high pressures. They've got mechanical components, software components, physical attacks that can destroy operations in seconds. Like I said, surprisingly, it's not a recipe for granny's apple pie. It's a recipe for disaster. So when we have a look at the impact, let's take a look at what happens when these things go wrong. This is a Russian power station. It's probably one of the most famous um, ICS failures. This basically had a turbine that was a thousand ton turbine that ramped up to such power in milliseconds it killed 75 people. And if you look on the, on the bottom left picture, you can probably see a guy standing on the wooden bridge. So that shows the scale of this. That, was, that basically made Russia almost launch a counter strike against the US because they thought it was a cyber attack. It wasn't at all, it was a cyber failure. It was a two dollar sensor that had fallen off the side of a, of a dam that had basically overfilled a reservoir, um, which was a big, big issue. Now again, when we have a look at the impact, on the left we've got a vehicle manufacturing plant, um, in the middle we've got a commercial boiler, and on the right we've got an expansion vessel which we've successfully blown up. Now, when we have a look on the left, let's make no mistake about it, that is an automated killing machine. If you walked in there, through those safety interlocks, it would kill you, without a single shadow of a doubt. So what is it that actually stops it killing you? Well, safety devices. But the things we rely on to keep us alive will always fail. And on the left, we've got a thermostat. On the right, we've got a temperature sensor. Um, so on the far right, we've got a, a pressure relief valve. Now, these will always fail. These are interchangeable parts, so we know they're going to fail at some point. In fact, when they do fail like this, you've now got a bomb within your building. Because if that pressure ramps up for overheating or for anything like that, and the pressure relief valve does not go off, that's what will happen. And that's exactly how we blew that expansion vessel up. Now, when we have a look at safety interlocks and the things that we rely on to keep us alive, this is an ABB controller. You can see here we've got a door interlock. Oh, this is the controller for that robotic arm and for that interlock. Who needs a screwdriver? In fact, we don't even have the keys for that. So we just use a screwdriver to get, in, to get into it ordinarily. So it's a big issue. Now, what we know about ICS is that over 30 billion pounds, about 50 billion dollars, has been lost in ICS failure, ransom, or cyber attacks. Um, there's been 70 plus incidents with severe environmental damage, 1,000 plus deaths reportedly. Um, and the environmental disaster of Deepwater Horizon was massive 68,000 plus square miles of, of ocean ruined. It's a big, big issue. But when we have a look at what most of them run, most of them run Windows. And I know what you're thinking, but believe it or not, Windows does have bugs in it. So it's a big issue. Um, and when we look at these systems, it does get worse. Most run Windows 7 still, some even run Windows 98. So it's a big, big problem. So when we carry out impact-based uh, pen testing ICS, what do we actually do? Well, the default rules do still apply. If you take a USB killer into these environments, clearly you're going to deck everything. Um, we still use standard tools, etc. But you're going to find things on Showdown. You're going to find web admin panels. You're going to find misconfigurations. You're going to be able to upgrade firmware. You're going to find default credentials. Now this is where things get a bit different. Now. We talk about the levels, and the Purge ICS model is probably considered the best thing for the levels of, of these devices. But levels seem to differ depending on where you look. In fact, here I've got three contradicting images of, of ICS levels. So for the purpose of this talk, and this is the issue, like, I, I think, like, how are we going to secure this stuff? We can't agree on the levels. But for the purpose of this talk, like level three we see as SCADA, level two we see as HMIs, PLCs, and controllers. Level one we see as sensors, and level zero we see as the fabric of buildings and the process. We're going to talk about why that is. But when we talk about PLCs, what we're talking about is programmable logic controller. I'm sure most of you know this anyway. Um, but these got multiple network types. We're not going to go too much into this, but we've got one of these around the corner. So if you want to see these and how we attack them, we're literally just out here. Um, so we've got this exact one. We're happy to show you it. We're also talking about BMS systems, so building management systems. Now, this is where I first started hacking these types of systems um, as a commercial gas engineer. These basically control all the set points and the building management throughout the building. Now, quite often these sit in these panels. So this is a 415 volt panel on the right hand side. You need to be qualified to open those in the UK. Here we can actually see where that pressurization units had a leak, but that's a different issue. Um, but what do we get if we open these up? Well, what we get is a router and a power socket. 
So straight away for us, that's a good spot. Now what's an ethical hacker going to do when they find a router in a locked cupboard with persistent power? Of course you're going to get your cat to hack it. So what does that hack look like? So what we did was, obviously I wanted to make a device that I could put into this cupboard and it isn't going to get found or isn't really going to alert people straight away. So I made this called the Hack Plug. And basically it's got multiple interfaces, so it, it can connect to an Ethernet, it can work through the power line for extra tracing data, it can connect to Wi-Fi, it also works on 3G and 4G and it's got local protocols as well, like Bluetooth Flow Energy, so we can connect to it locally. Now to drill into this quickly with the components, components just a surge protector lead, it's got a D-shelled laptop power supply which gives us 3 amps, um, it's got Pi Zero, that's running Kali for, for Pi 2. Uh, it's got Wi-Fi module, Ethernet connector. Yeah, it's got all that in it, so we'll give you the speculative software from. So now we're talking about default rules to not apply. So ICS safe network enumeration. So here's an example of how you'd enumerate an ICS network safely. Because even just enumerated network can flood it and deny the service on it. So once we've done that, we want to start looking at safe test rigs. So we're not taking down an actual process, although we did, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But a lot of what we throw is at these test rigs. They work in the exact same way as a process. Um, so they're really, really good bits of kit. But what are we actually talking about when we say SCADA, ICS, plant, PLCs, RTUs? Well, this is what we consider plant equipment. So heating, cooling, distribution. Here we've got gas meters, thermostatic controller, uh, fan core unit, and some commercial boilers. Here you've got shop floor equipment, so things that you'd find throughout a process on the shop floor. You've got HMIs, human machine interfaces, quite often run Windows CE, Windows embedded. Here you've got remote terminal units, I think over here they're referred to as remote te uh, telemetry units. Um, we've also got field terminal units. But more importantly, we've got the sensors. Now these are the tentacles of a control system, they're the eyes and ears of a control system. Um, they report on information such as temperature, pressure, flow, humidity, orientation. They report that back to the PLC. Now these are the types of sensors that you can have throughout these environments. So you can have a whole plethora of, um, of sensors available to you. But when we start looking at, at sensors, we move into safety devices. Now, when we look at safety interlocks, they're made to keep us alive. They stop machines in an emergency. Obviously, throughout processes, we have emergency stop buttons, but that's an electrical circuit reporting to an electronic device. In fact, we know from Stuxnet that the emergency stop buttons weren't working, and there's a number of ways of doing that. We've got overheat sensors, expansion vessels, pressure relief valves, like we discussed. I'm not going to list everything here, but you get the idea of, of what we're talking about. Now, when we have a look at attacks, and obviously this is what everyone really wants to see, it's safe, right? Well, actually, not even safe to safe. So this is research I've done over like, the past five or six years. It's pretty old now. But you can see it just proves that it's locked. That's all it takes to get into it. So I put this out, and I've been in the hacking community for quite a while, and um, everyone was like, yeah, you know, it's great, but it's crappy safe, and whatever. So I was like, all right, challenge accepted. So this is Costco's display safe. So this is a century safe. It's a medium range safe, it's not super cheap, it's not super expensive. And it's basically just as we're in Costco. So it's just a rare earth magnet, if you can't hear it, and a sock. Simple as that. So obviously, responsible disclosure, we told Century about this and we said, look, we found the floor in your safe. And they said, yeah, yeah, that's great, but we're not really interested. We've defended it on the next one. And they were releasing a new version. So it's all right, fair enough. So uh, this is their current version. So this is their new version. This is the one that you can buy now. Oh, cool. So some of you probably recognise this safe. We hacked it before the magnet. Um, basically, Century have put a defence into it. So we've got the same near the magnet. What they've done is made it that when you place the magnet onto the safe, it won't actually unlock it. So you can see the safe is still completely locked. But all you actually need to do is tip the safe forward. Tip it back. <laughs> and, and this is their most recent one. So what we're saying is that even safe products aren't necessarily safe, and people will more than happily sell you stuff which is insufficient. Now when we look at the way that this actually works, this is what's inside them. It's an electromagnetic solenoid valve. I can list off loads of attacks on these. Um, but this video just shows a bit about how it works. It's a safe hacking, so this is the quick principle behind it. It's a little electromagnetic solenoid. So basically when you put the pin in, it doesn't interfere with the lock at all. And I mean the pin as in the digital pin code. All it does is closes the circuit, 
which makes this go like that. You pull it, that's it, that clears the way for you to do it. So obviously the way to do it is either bang it, which just bounces this up and down. So when you bang it, that's what you're doing. Short circuit it. Short just circuit it. it down, or just use the magnet, and the magnet just emulates this electromagnet. And again, in turn pulls it down. That's it. That's what keeps you safe and safe. So in fact, so when we started looking at these, I went down the security aisle in Home Base, which is like Home Depot over here, and we hacked every single thing in this picture, but they're still happy to sell them. So it's a big problem. But how do we know how to attack all these? Well, in fact, they're all gas valves that we find throughout industrial environments. They're any smart valve, pretty much. Um, and when we look at examples of where these are, on the top left, you've got a gas valve, which is probably what you'd find in your domestic boiler at home. Um, that's just got two electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic solenoids on it. It's got one for the pilot, one for the main burner. Um, and then here we can see more commercial industrial ones. Now, these are all safety interlocked into things like fire alarms, into emergency stop buttons. So if a fire alarm's triggered, then it will shut the gas supply off into a building. Um, so if you can mess with that, you can mess with these. So that's a big issue. Now, when we have a look at things like sensors, this is an ABB's uh, reception, and basically this says when you can measure what you are speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. When you cannot measure it, your knowledge is meagre and unsatisfactory, and it's completely true. Sensors are probably one of the most important things for an industrial process or a commercial process or whatever you're doing, um, and sensors really are the keys to the kingdom, I think anyway, and we'll talk about why. Now, like we said, the sensors are the tentacles of a control system. They're very easily spoofed. But the network accepts that data as fact. So if that, if that data is being pushed up from a sensor, the network will always accept it. The PLC will always accept it. It's got no way of, of checking if it's correct or not. They work on a 4 to 20 milliamp circuit, some of them, which measures things like resistance, current, or digital output, so with a, with a UID, etc. cetera. Um, but they're very easy to trick. It's very easy to trick the system into doing something, or more importantly, trick people into doing something. Now, if you can spoof these sensors and you make it look like heat detectors are going off everywhere, that looks to an operator like there's a fire. The first thing that he's going to do is shut everything down. In reality, there's nothing going wrong with that process at all. So spoofing the sensors is a big thing. These are really easy to intercept, manipulate, and forward on. A bunch of different ways that they work. Um, but like we said, they look at things like temperature, pressure, fuel levels, etc. And we start having a look at ICS network attacks. Clearly, denial of service attacks still work. With that, you can stop control, you can stop visibility. So if you can carry out denial of service attacks, stop people controlling those PLCs. Obviously, look, we look at things like fuzzing protocols, but most of the switches that we find on these systems are unmanaged, which is a big, big problem, obviously. Now, with that, if you can connect, you can control. So you can attack any levels connected to the network, whether that's a, um, a supervisory thing or a corporate network. Um, you can attack all of them. And really, you don't need Metasploit or 1710 Eternal Blue when you have TIA Portal, which is Siemens proprietary software. If you can get onto a network, you literally click enumerate all the PLCs around you, and it will give you a list of all of them which is a massive, massive issue. So local access is a big thing. Now when we have a look at the limitations of the network, this is a standard denial of service attack. So to anybody that's really technical and uses LOIC or HOIC, don't need either of them. Literally all you need is hyperping, that's it. Um, here it just shows a, a basic denial of service attack, but on that port and the right IP address, you'll stop um, a supervisor communicating with that network, basically. Um, really, really simple attack, really simple. Now, when we look at hacking human segregation, the things that we use to keep us alive, these are standard interlocks. So here we've got a Schneider one on the left, and that works with a twin pole magnetic switch. Um, on the right, we've got a light barrier. But engineers ordinarily use these to cut the system off anyway. So rather than walking right back to a panel, they just stick their hand through it, and that will cut the system off. They're expecting it to anyway. Um, so that's a big problem. But if we have a look at what we need to hack these, of course we use computers, but really you need things like magnets, screwdrivers, and mirrors. If you've got these three things, you can start causing havoc within, uh, within industrial environments. So if we have a look at PLCs and stopping the process, this is another quick video that we made of a uh, demonstration. So here, the test rig's just running the process. It picks this up, verifies there's a hole in it, transfers it over. And here we can see from our attack machine, sticking in the IP, setting a port number. And there's a couple of frameworks out there that you can get for this. Set port to 102, which is Siemens control port. It counts down here. Three, two, one, killed. 
And that would work as well on any huge industrial process. I mean, don't be fooled because it's a small rig, because it's working the exact same way as proper industrial process would. So when we start having a look at hacking these safety devices, well, these are easy to bypass. A lot of them are, are normally open or normally closed devices, so they're very easy to satisfy or not satisfy. We can very, very easily cause overpressurization. Um, that turns your infrastructure into a bomb, like we said, and we can see the effects of this here. Whether you want to blow heat exchangers, you want to blow expansion vessels, you want to blow holes through buildings, that's a good way of doing it. Um, obviously, you can overheat processes and equipment, you can blow expansion vessels, like we said, that's often the first thing to go. So, wherever you've got heat in a system, obviously that creates expansion. To absorb that expansion, you need an expansion vessel. If you can cap that, or you can take it out, or even just overheat or overpressurize it with a defective PRV, that's exactly what's going to happen. Um, with that, you can destroy property and cause huge damage. Of course, you can kill people. It's one of the biggest effects of this. If you understand the process or the cycle of setup, then your adversary is in trouble. And we call that the modern spanner. Because people say about putting a spanner in the works. Well, you're not going to chuck a spanner in an industrial process, but the right thing in the right place will always work. And really, it's just knowing that system and what that means. Now, of course, in SCADA, things get ransomed. It's a case study of a company in South Brazil. Uh, they got done with CryptoLocker. In fact, Finno is a big Taiwanese manufacturer, the biggest manufacturer in Taiwan, that was down for two days. And when you look at the cost of, of what that means, it's a big, big issue. So now, to get to some of our research, one of our clients, an extremely well-known company, um, we were going to say what sector they were in, but they weren't very happy about it. But basically, they gave us access to multiple lines, but we were provided with one to attack it. So they run four lines in their, in their facility. Each one of those lines makes £10,000 of production a minute. It's a super, super high value, but that's not uncommon. That's not uncommon at all. Um, and that's yeah, for each production line. We didn't want to attack level four and five, it was out of scope, so we didn't want to attack that at all. And we did not want to leave a trace, more importantly. So getting into how we lost our client this money, how did it actually work? Well, step one, we wanted physical access. Like we said, we want impact-based stuff. And we're going to talk about physical access. That doesn't mean that you have to walk in um, and do stuff, but we wanted physical access. Next, we wanted to weaponize an Arduino. So we wanted that to enumerate the network. Again, unmanaged switches, so really, really easy to go onto the network. Enumerate the network and tell us what it is. And when we say about physical access, it could be something like this, again. So it could just be sticking an extension lead in, which is really, really difficult for people to identify. And then, of course, step four was the actual attack. Now, this is not our attack code. This is from a framework. But you can see that the attack, I actually struggled to call it an attack because all we've actually done is just sent these PLC stop commands. That's it. And we just keep repeating those stop commands. It's really, really difficult to stop. So as much as I'd want to say some super technical rock chain, um, like buffer overflow or shellcode exploit, it really isn't. All it is is just stop commands. And you can see those here. Um, really, really simple stuff. So within five seconds, the attack's complete. We took the former head of the Mets, uh, the Metropolitan Police e-crime unit with us to investigate. And he said that after his investigation, there was no way to easily identify the attack and definitely not enough artifacts for attribution. So we would have got away with it, really. That's the truth of it. And even when we did get physical access, there was blind spots everywhere, no physical controls. It was a massive, massive problem for them. So the production was, line was down for two hours while safety checks were carried out. Um, again, I would be very naive to think that it's just a simple reset. It's not. Any, any company that's responsible is going to want to know why their process has stopped. Is somebody trapped in a machine? And when we look at something like this client, for example, their site was over 40 acres. So it's a huge, huge plant. Um, they're not just going to click reset. What they're going to do is an SCBO. So they're going to do a status check before operation, before they reset it. So it's down for two hours. It was only one line. That's 10,000 pounds, that's 120 minutes, 1.2 million pound that they lost in that amount of time. If it had been on all four lines, we see 4.8 million pound. So if we look at that compared to the Taiwanese attack that we've just seen, which was two days, they would have lost millions, tens, even hundreds of millions. They would have lost on that. So all of these things are critical to the operation of modern society. And now we're seeing a lot of industrial IoT. So when we look at some of the hardware attacks, obviously we attack the sensors, obviously we want to bypass safety interlocks. Even a power surge or a flood would be a legit vector. Um, but really, we look at things like chip decapping, like IoT, reverse engineering, UART attacks, and everyone thinks that's some crazy voodoo hacking shit. It's not at all. What it actually is, is me. This is actually at my mum's house on a dining room table when I was at a family event. And um, basically, I've just stripped down a Philips Hue, I've banged some headers into it, um, and then I've used an Arduino to, to start carrying out a UART attack. Straight away, we've got into the bootloader, we can set the security EMV. As soon as you do that, drop into a root shot. Simple as that. And we're seeing a lot of this type of stuff in industrial IoT. It's a big, big issue. 
again, like when we look at current solutions, so we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We wanted to, to put really sensible things in place for our clients. So we started looking at secure RJ45. Now, our managed switches, big issue. Someone's going to plug into it. So we wanted to occupy those ports, and we wanted to do that with secure RJ45. So we went to this company, and we said, look, we're a team of, of hackers and security engineers. In reality, are we going to be able to stick a screwdriver into your product and get it out? And they said, no, nah, no, nah, no way. Of course you can't. If you did, you'll just damage it. So they sent us a sample kit. This is their sample kit. This is within three minutes of receiving it. So you can see it didn't take a screwdriver at all. It took two spoons. That was it. So what we're saying is there is no real secure options, despite the marketing. So despite what we see people marketing stuff as, we don't really consider them to be secure. There's no real tamper evidence or alerting. It just damages it, if it damages it at all. Like we said, you can get through these um, without damaging it at all. There's huge limitations and applications and usability of this type of kit. So in summary, Hacking ICS is serious. Hacking stuff has severe consequences, obviously, because of what's involved in it. It's not a simple reset or recovery. It loses a shed load of money, um, and it can mess with things we all rely on to keep us safe and secure. Of course, the biggest um, thing is it can directly kill people, and that has happened with 1,000 plus deaths. Um, but what I'd say is that people are often not PLCs, and so it's bad. PLCs are great bits of kit, super, super reliable bits of kit that we all rely on every day. Um, but they're clearly not as mature as computer systems, and we definitely haven't got that maturity within the security of them. Um, so really, that's why we give talks like this and why we want more people to get involved and hopefully help us secure them. And that is pretty much it for me, open to any questions. Uh, questions. Yeah, yeah. How come we haven't seen more real ransomware attacks on ICS, uh, like on factories, like on not catch a one, but real, real ransomware attacks? Yeah. I think, to be honest, this hasn't been on people's radar. And I think security for obscurity has been a big thing for this. Now, it's very difficult to get access to labs. And I've seen a lot more of that now with things like the ICS village. Um, I think it comes to the understanding of what people are doing, but also it comes to the reporting of it. Now, under GDPR, obviously, people have to report if there has been some sort of data breach. But would they have to report a crypto attack? Maybe not. Um, in the UK, especially, you're not obliged to report anything to the police. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, hopefully, yeah. So, so um, yeah, so it's, it's a big issue. I mean, how much is it going on? We haven't really got too much visibility in it. Um, but yeah, I'd say at the moment we've been very lucky. And I think when somebody finds a way to ransom PLCs, it's going to be a big problem. Because there's so many of these on Shodan, they yeah, literally you can get access to hundreds, thousands of them. Yeah, no problem. Cool. Any other questions? Cool. Well, yeah, if anyone's got any questions, I said we're around the corner. Um, it's fine, me or my colleague Simon. Happy to have a chat. Oh.